So the session is now um, being recorded. So I wanted to go briefly through our agenda for today's session. Um, I'm going to uh, share a couple of poll questions um, and then introduce our panelists. Uh, each of the um, four panelists that are with us today are um, going to give some brief presentations. And then after those presentations, we're just gonna open it up um, to questions and answers um, uh, or to questions um, from the audience. So um, before introducing the panelists, I did wanna bring up these poll questions. Give me just one second here. Um, so the first question um, is what level of importance would you assign to the translation of the Carpentries resources? And we'll give everyone just a little bit of time to answer this question. So it's looking like most um, folks are selecting uh, it's very important and should be prioritized. Great, thanks everyone. And then I have one other question um, I wanted to, to ask. Um, Who has done any translation of Carpentry's resources that's here with us today? So it seems most folks have not done um, any previously. So, okay, great. Thanks everyone. Are y'all able to see the results that from the from the poll? No. Okay, sorry about that. Let's see. So there's the um, the results from the first question that was asked. So um, you see that 83% said very important and should be prioritized and 17% said important but does not need to be prioritized. And then um, when I asked the question about, um, have you done any translations of Carpentry's resources? Everyone that responded said that they have not. Um, so let me uh, introduce our panelists and we'll um, uh, turn it over to them. Um, so David Perez Juarez is a Carpentries instructor, trainer, and maintainer. Um, he created and maintained the infrastructure to translate pre-workbench Carpentries lessons, and he works as a research software engineer at the University of College London. Um, Joel Nita is at the University of Tokyo. Um, he's a Carpentries instructor and active member in the Japan community. His research is on ecology and evolution of ferns. Um, we also have um, Toby Hodges joining us today, who is the director of curriculum at the Carpentries, where he leads the curriculum team. Um, before joining the core team, he worked as a scientific community manager at the European um, Molecular Biology Laboratory. And then finally, we have Camilla Rangel Smith, who is a research data scientist at the Allen Turing Institute and one of the leads of the Turing Way translation and localization team. Um, so welcome to all four of you. It's so great to have you here today. Um, I'm going to pass it over um, to da David to get um, us started with uh, um, your presentation. Good day, everyone. Right, so I'm going to talk about the history of the translations. If I manage to share my screen. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. So. Yes, you can see my screen, right? Yep. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Right. So I'm going to talk about the history of the translations, um, a brief history of the translation of the, uh, of the carpentry material. 
And I've been involved in the translations probably since 2014, when people, uh, at least some Spaniards and at least one Brazilian person, started to say, oh, why we don't translate the things? Maybe there were some translation before. I'm not aware of that. But um, I, from that point is when I've been involved with the translations. At the beginning, we started with taking the repository of the translation, making a fork of that uh, repository into either Spanish or Portuguese and starting to translate the text. So they have all like the, 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 the plain text and putting their translations and yeah, that's how it works. But early on, we, we realized that that was not very really sustainable. We didn't, we have different repositories. We didn't have any way to track what's have changed from upstream. So whenever something was changed, we were pulling and then trying to find the conflicts and why the conflicts, trying to find what it has been new in the lesson and trying to translate that. And we also were working directly on the Markdown files. So it was difficult to see, like you, you're overwriting what you what you had underneath in, in English. So it was kind of a, not comfortable to translate in that way. And of course, I, at the end of the story, we didn't know how much has been translated because you have a full type, a file of text and it was very, very difficult. So from that early on, we were realizing that it was not a good way. And it took me till 2017 uh, during a hack day that the Source of the Institute uh, run when I found what I create this other way, the way that we have been running till now, which is essentially a core repository, which is this lesson I, I, I end that I have on the top left. And through Gitsu modules, I was connecting with the other repositories and each other repository, which was the source, it has another submodules with the translations of the repositories. Now, these translations were automatically generated by the main repository on the left, the i18n, which it contains these files that I'm gonna explain in a second. That also gave me an advantage or a point where I could pro provide a kind of a dashboard where you could see what has been translated and in which language and to which level. Uh, they have been either translated or also reviewed. With that infrastructure in place that um, created back in 2017, I was able to then go to a lesson repository and visualize the website in multiple languages. As you can see in the top right corner, just yes, uh, to the left of the search bar, they have this little uh, globe. And that was the, the button I created to change the languages. So that allowed me from a single repository page to uh, display the content of the different lessons. Let in, in that way, kind of uh, avoiding or removing the responsibility of the maintainers to have to also take care of the translation because that was taken care through this other uh, machinery. Now that machinery was not um, as simple. Yes, I highlighted there at the bottom. Um, but that's essentially how it works. You have a, a bunch of markdown files. Those markdown files then get converted uh, into a POT file. These POT files are like a, a template for translations. And then people were copying that file into the different languages that you want to translate. So I, so I have the example here of Spanish in the top and Japanese in the bottom. And once that you translate this file, which is like you have each paragraph separated and, and it's a particular formatting for translation, then you can back and generate again the markdown files as in the beginning, and those they were the one that were presented to the users. There's a step there is not shown there, but you have this long file which is contains everything. At the moment, actually, we break them in, in, we split them into small chunks, so it's easier to for the translators to know from where that file comes from. Right, so once that we have those files, we put it in a, pl in a platform. Right now, it's Transifex, which it has multiple. Uh, view. So it may be a bit overwhelming this image, but what we have essentially is uh, two blocks. The block on the left is what it's a, this POT file is how it's presented, where you have on the left bar, on the left column, you have the original language, on the right column, you have the, um, what is being translated. Then on the second half of the page, on the right hand side, is where you have in the top the, the message for, to, to be translated, and in the bottom where the person write the translation. That has, um, once that you translate that appears on back on the left and the left hand side and that helps you to, to see which blocks has been translated or not, if this has been full or not. A, some advantages that have this 
this thing is that now you can see on the right hand side that we get also like on the more right like a, a suggestion history a glossary so it keeps you a a way of keeping you the, the history. And particularly if you have the glossary, it helps you to keep consistency through the translations. So that was very good and nice. Now, with what we've done so far since 2014, when we started till now. So back in 2014, uh, we used this old, old way of translating, which was from the file itself. So we managed to translate many of the lessons. But as you can see from the history of those repositories pictures, many of them are uh, hasn't been touched since. 2018 or 2019 because what i'm saying of the difficulty to keep it track of what is happening mm -hmm. uh, the korean community also translated a bunch of lessons and we have there some examples as well from 2018 16 and and the, in portuguese at least by one person raniere translated the bc bc doesn't stands for before COVID, it stands for a boot camp and that was a where we started in Spanish as well, back in 2014 and 2015. So he managed, he worked in that old, old lesson um, repository and also in the workshop template to help the, the translation. Now, after that, with a new method, that's kind of how it looks. So we have at least, um, I'm presenting here, uh, seven different translations for different lessons. And you can see in the, each translation, we have what is the, the progress of each of the languages. So we have uh, Spanish is in more of them, most of them, but then there's also German, Italian, Portuguese. And you can see some of them are with a blue light color, which means that has been translated and reviewed. And when it is green, it means that it has been translated, but it hasn't been reviewed. So it also gives you the, the opportunity to see how much of that has been translated and how much of it has been reviewed. The Japanese community, however, hasn't used that uh, platform so far yet uh, in, 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 in in much, uh, they were using really on from GitHub, translating it from the POT files, and this is the stats that a uh, they got. However, even so, it says 100% there. It seems that the only one that has been 100% translated is the the R novice uh, gap minder, I believe. The other one might be shown 100% because this translation. Uh, snippets has been either with one word or something, or and then uh, the program thing that has been translated. However, uh, I don't know what is the status of the review of those things, but I believe the R novice gap minder has been fully translated and fully reviewed. Right, so how, how large is the community so far? So through TransFX, at least, I found that there's a, at least 85 Spanish people, uh, Spanish speaking people, not, not from Spain, most of them probably from um, uh, Latin America. We got like eight Italian, eight Portuguese, five Japanese, four German and three Ukrainian. Those are like uh, in the last uh, few months. Uh, also, we got a couple of them in French and one in Korean. From the Japanese also mentioned that at least 11 of them are also uh, co contributing through, um, through GitHub. So it, I don't know whether it will be 16 or only 11 is the total number. But anyway, we, we see that the community over, at least over the last four years have grown a lot. Now, some people may ask, okay, what is the recognition for those people that those translations? Well, if we translate using this kind of a POT format that we've been doing till now, uh, each of the files it get with kind of header, which contains like some information like that, who has been translated on that particular file. So it keeps the names of uh, the people and the last year that they have been contributing to the, to the translation. So all that is happening automatically through the platforms. Now, what are the a summary of the whole thing of what we've done so far? It's a uh, many of the lessons like the Git, the shell, the, the basic for R and the Python. They have been already fully translated in three languages, Spanish, Korean, and Japanese in um, many different levels of review, but they're uh, already there. There have been some good progress on, on some domain specific lessons like the um, geospatial lessons in R and, and one of them also of, um, uh, ecology and it has been a great effort uh, from the whole community so it's been a lot of good input from everyone now what do we have what are the lessons to learn well uh, the format this pot file that i call is it's called git, git get text uh, it's a good approach to keep uh, the track of translations progress uh, but it needs it's, it's a 
it's a new format, so people need to learn this a little bit and 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 either use the tools appropriate like TransFX, or they may get into uh, some problems. The and as I say, TransFX or other trans translation platforms is the lot the translation review and the translation and the review of any of the work. Problems. All this machinery that I created is very tailored, uh, and it only probably works for the carpentries as it is now. Uh, so whenever we need a new lesson, I have to do something else there to fix it. Uh, the use of two modules are complicated for the maintainers a little bit. So uh, if you are not a kind of proficiency in, on Git, that it, it creates a barrier. And it hasn't been adopted officially by any of the lesson or the maintainers. So it's there like an, an official thing that we have, but it, it yes, it's not yet there. And most of all, uh, I've been the bottleneck of everything as if someone changed the, the trans effects or in the repository is there been waiting for me to do something so that it can be visualized on the website or it can be a new lesson created. So I'm the bottleneck right now. And, and that, yeah and help. Now, that's been all with the old style of the lessons, and Joel will tell you in a second about the, the plans for the new format, the workbench. Uh, just to end, uh, two years ago in the last uh, Carpentry Con, we did kind of a trans translation um, together, at least for the Spanish people. We have a 24 hours um, kind of a translaton, <laughs> and you can read more about that on the blog of that session that is in the Carpentry's blog. And that's all for me. Great, thanks so much, David. Um, I'm going to pass it over um, to Joel. Okay, uh, thank you very much, David, for the wonderful presentation and Alicia for organizing everything. Um, just a moment, well, please bear with me while I get this set up. Just a moment. While Joel is doing that too, I, I added a um, link into the Zoom chat. Um, if you have questions as we're going through the presentations, feel free to add those into the Etherpad for the panel. Okay, almost there, almost there. <laughs> All right, um, can everybody see my screen? Yeah, we're good. Okay, great, I'll get started then. Um, so yeah, my talk here is called uh, Translation at the Carpentries, Technology Past, Present, and Future. And oh, I wanted to mention that this, all my slides are um, available as a website uh, that you can access at the URL there, and I just put that in the chat. Okay. So um, I want to step back for a moment and, and think more broadly about what is translation and how to translate. Well, in the case of the Carpentries, it's not quite as simple as if we are just rewriting text from one, one language into another as if you're, say, translating a novel. And that's because in the case of a novel, the original text is in its final version and it's never going to change. So you could just convert that and be done with it. But Carpentries lessons are a little bit different. Uh, they're what I call technical documents. That means they're rendered using software. And so this presents some unique challenges. So when it comes to technical translation, we need to be able to first update the translation when the original changes. So this is especially true of Carpentry's lessons. They're getting improved and updated all the time. So uh, just making, making the translation once uh, doesn't mean we're done. We have to be able to go back to it and, and update. And the other thing is that we need to deal with two levels here, the source code and then the rendered version. So the source code being like, markdown files, and then the rendered version is the actual rendered web page. And furthermore, uh, most solutions for translating source code, like some of the tools that uh, David mentioned, uh, Git text and PO files, have been designed with software in mind and not prose text. So they're not necessarily straightforward to implement for uh, things like Tar Carpentry's lessons. Um, and this is my slide showing uh, an explanation of what PO files do. And I won't go into this too much detail because David already described it. Um, just to say that the PO file sort of serves as a link between the original language on the left and the translated language on the right. And that in the text of that PO file, uh, it breaks down the content line by line. And so we can match up the original and the translation line by line 
And if something changes in the original, we have a granular view and we can pinpoint exactly what needs to change in the translation. So that's the motivation for using these PO files. Okay, so here I wanna once again, step back a little bit and think about what is kind of technical translation anyways. So um, what we're talking about all big picture is translation, but we can break that down and do a couple components. And you might've heard about this in other places uh, online. So it, we often say that has two aspects, internationalization and localization. And these sound kind of similar and it's a somewhat subtle difference, um, but I do think it's a useful one uh, to distinguish. So internationalization, which is often written I18N for the number of characters in that word, because software engineers don't like to type out long words, they abbreviate to I18N. Uh, that describes the process of providing the actual software framework to support translation. And so this requires technical knowledge, but the person who does that doesn't actually have to know anything about a particular language that they'd be translating into. They're just providing the scaffolding to do that. And then the localization or L10N uh, is the act of actually translating strings or words, right? So that does require linguistic knowledge, but it does not necessarily require knowledge of the entire framework that is in place to do the translation process. Okay. So it's just kind of useful to have these two concepts in mind. And in practical, from a practical standpoint, uh, there may be different people involved in these. It could be the same person in some cases. Uh, it just depends. So, um, so David, David already did a really nice uh, overview of the past approach, and that is using what is called the styles format, um, past lesson style slash the one that is also currently being used, uh, and it looks like this. I think probably anybody who has taken part in a carpentry's lesson or taught a carpentry's lesson is used to web pages that look like this. And so uh, to distinguish that from a new format that I'll describe uh, soon, uh, we're calling that styles. Um, and I have some slides that describe uh, the method that David designed uh, for translating that, but I'm not gonna go into detail uh, about that right now uh, because uh, these are actually for the second time we do this panel when David is not gonna be here. So. I'll just uh, kind of go through these quickly. Um, so I do want to mention, um, though, a sort of a case study and using this system um, to just exemplify how, to give an example of, of, of what we've done with it. Um, and this is from the, the community that I'm involved in, the Carpentries JA community uh, in Japan. And um, as David mentioned, instead of using uh, the TransFX platform, we actually had members of the community uh, edit the PO file uh, themselves, however they wanted to, either in a plain text editor or in software designed for editing PO files. And then we checked those translations and managed all of the translations and our collaborative workflow using GitHub. Um, so this screenshot is an example of uh, using the PR review tools in GitHub to check a translation. So we had a, a workflow in place where we basically had two roles for everybody who participated. You're either a translator or a reviewer. Um, and so before the translation could be merged and made official, it had to be submitted as a PR, and then that PR had to be checked and approved by the reviewer. And so, um, Using that method, we were able to complete the R novice gap minder lesson. And recently we've been, uh, and, and since then, we've been focusing on Git novice and shell novice. We're trying to do the software carpentry lessons uh, first. And um, because we are able to completely finish the R lesson, we had our first workshop in Japanese uh, last year. So that was really exciting. And it was fantastic to finally be able to use the materials that we had put so much work into translating. Um, and we really want to do some more workshops. Um, but I should mention that Carpentry is just getting started in Japan. We have no member institutions, only a handful of instructors. So unfortunately don't have as many workshops uh, as we would like to teach, uh, but hopefully that will change in the future. So some take home messages from this sort of case study. Uh, 
things that worked well, the green stickies. Uh, GitHub works great for collaboration. Well, that's what it's designed for, right? So that makes sense. And it's it's nice that you can do translation review in the browser. Uh, and it and looking at the diff is a great way to to um, compare it and see how things have changed. Stuff that didn't work so well, uh, the red stickies. Uh, the requirement for being able to use Git, even just to do a PR review, I would say is a very high barrier to your participation. If you've never used Git before, even doing things just in the web browser and not at the command line is, is still pretty, pretty difficult. Um, and unfortunately, this leads to burnout because there's only a limited number of members who, who can contribute. Um, and so I'm, I'm sad to say that recently our Japanese community hasn't made a whole lot of progress because um, we, we had a big push to finish the R lesson, but we haven't made it too far since then. Um, however, <laughs> there are some changes coming. Um, so some of you may be familiar with um, the upcoming uh, format of, of Carpentry's lessons called the workbench format that's being developed by Jiang Kumbar. And uh, earlier I showed a, a screenshot of the styles format. This is what the workbench format looks like. Um, and if you're interested in that, I urge you to, uh, well, just Google <laughs> Carpentry's workbench and you'll see uh, Jiang's already put out a lot of blog posts and information about it. Um, so the workbench format, uh, what makes it really different from the past format, the styles format, is that it is based primarily on R Markdown and Pandoc, and it's all used through a series of R packages. Um, so, well, this is especially good if you already know R. If you don't, you'll do have to do a little bit of learning. But overall, I do think it makes that the rendering of lessons, that means going from the code to the actual final web page, much, much simpler. Uh, and it means that it's easy to do that locally. And so recently, I've been working on an R package to facilitate translating uh, using the workbench format uh, that I call Dovetail. So I'll describe that in a little bit, or describe that uh, a little bit. Um, so some features of Dovetail. First of all, I have it set up so that each translation is contained within the lesson. We don't have a separate repo with submodules. Um, rendering is, again, this is thanks to the way Workbench is set up, which is thanks to the design of, of Xi'an. Uh, rendering is easily accomplished by the translator. So the translator, after they translate their string, they can actually see what the website looks like. And um, I do want to have, I, I want to eventually develop more functionality so that this can plug directly into translation platforms like Transifex. So this is a screenshot of what using Dovetail looks like in R. Um, and what I want you to notice is, don't worry about the details, but um, please notice that it's uh, three or four R commands to go to um, generate all of the scaffold needed, scaffolding needed to uh, make the translations and then to translate the MD files and then build the website. So it makes this pretty easy, I think, uh, and so it should enable translators to render websites uh, on their own. And this is what the output of that process would look like. Um, so if this is a, a view of the file hierarchy in a website, uh, a, a Carpentry's lesson website folder, uh, we have some uh, MD files in the original language. And well, there's a lot of other files that I'm skipping here. But what Dovetail does is it creates uh, two additional folders. One is PO, and that stores the PO files. And then there's subfolders for each language. And then another folder is locale, and that's where we're going to generate the translated output. And again, those are in subfolders by language, and it has the built website. There. So to, oops, to sum up about Dovetail, the de design philosophy here is that I want to make it easier for their maintainer to maintain. So that's the internationalization side. And we're not dependent on one person maintaining one central repo. I also want to make it easier for translators to translate. That's the localization side. And so this me and specifically, it should only require minimal technical knowledge to participate. You don't necessarily need to know uh, about Git, for example. And so big picture, um, I think if we can sort of lower the bar to participation in translation in the carpentries, we can really use this as a great tool 
to promote participation and grow our local communities. Because um, when we're trying to make the Carpentries a more global organization, uh, it's, it's really important to have these lesson materials available in people's native languages. Um, and this serves two purposes. And by translating, we can both do that and uh, get people involved and get them um, participating. So uh, yeah, that's, that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Joel. That was great. Um, we're going to um, turn it over now to our um, other two panelists. Um, so Toby Hodges is going to be um, representing um, the Carpentries core team to talk a little bit about translations from that perspective. And then um, we'll have Camilla talk about what the Turing Way, which is another adjacent community of the Carpentries, what they've been doing as well. So Toby, we'll have you go next. Sure. Thanks, Alicia. Um, I don't have any slides, um, but I've prepared a few notes about what to say. So um, I want to begin by thanking, I guess, Joel and David specifically, because they're on the panel today, but also all of the other community members um, who've contributed to those translated Carpentries lessons and the other associated materials like the um, workshop and, and lesson templates. Um, as well that, that David mentioned in his um, talk about the history of translation in the Carpentries. They've both, David and Joel, um, done a really good job of, of summarizing the work that's been done already, but 10 minutes each isn't really long enough to, I guess, express how impressive those efforts have, have really been. For example, um, you might have noticed in Joel's slides a link to um, the i18n handbook which is documentation that i think david wrote um to help translators and, and maintainers learn how to use the system that he was describing and i mean just the time that it takes to write decent kind of onboarding material like that for people to be able to learn to use these systems um and to contribute effectively is you know it's a considerable effort and and just thank you, I guess, for, for volunteering your time to do something like that for the community. These translation projects are, are really impressive and they're really important. Um, they're the result really of a huge and pretty much completely voluntary effort from a growing but still relatively small group um, compared to the overall size of the Carpentries community. And like I said, that's important work and it, it should be recognized and it should be supported probably more so than the Carpentries team has been doing over the, um, over the previous years. So I'm really delighted that these panel discussions are taking place during CarpentryCon this year. Um, uh, translations are, are really an essential step to us continuing to uh, grow and to become truly global as a community. Joel mentioned that that we've got no member organizations in Japan yet, for example, and that really for me is, is a demonstration of exactly why it's so vital for us to have lessons in, in other languages, because it's not reasonable to expect us to start with memberships from organizations and then have translations later, I don't think. Um, we can get away with that in some cases in, in countries where um, English is still a, a sort of a commonly spoken language or, or if we're looking at organizations where, where it's common to work in English, like uh, research organizations uh, in a lot of parts of the world, for example. But generally speaking, if we want to be truly inclusive and truly global, then we need to, to have um, versions of our lessons and the supporting materials for those lessons in other languages as well. And I think, I hope that panel discussions like this are a step towards a stronger connection between the core team and the translation community. I'm also hoping that we can grow that translation community during this conference. So it's really great to see all of the folks attending this call who said at the beginning that they haven't yet contributed to translation of Carpentries. Um, it's really vital that those efforts are, are supported and recognized in the wider Carpentries community as well. Um, David mentioned recognition for translators as kind of uh, a list of the people who've worked on the translations within those translated lessons themselves, but there's um, 
there's more that we can be doing to to kind of acknowledge those lessons more widely within the community and it's important to to do that and to support those efforts because we want to make sure that lesson translation and maintenance of translations is sustainable um lesson translation projects are like any other open source project and and open source projects um one of the things we observe with them is that the core contributors who set things up and drive things forwards um, inevitably move on to new projects and new communities or find themselves generally with less time to contribute than they used to have. Um, what it means for a project to be sustainable is that it can survive and thrive even beyond the departure of any of those individual contributors making the carpentries community and our activities sustainable in general has been a defining theme i think for the work of the core team certainly in the time that i've been a member of the core team so for the last couple of years um but also i think in for several years before that and in that context of thinking about sus sustainability, I have to acknowledge that the core team could and should have been doing a lot more to promote translation efforts and to support translation translation efforts in recent years. Um, two of our core values as, a, as an organization are to be inclusive of all and to champion access for all. And the second of the six goals in our um, current strategic plan um, is to intentionally incorporate equity, inclusion and accessibility to support a diverse community and translation of lessons and other resources has to be a major part of that. So we want to support these efforts and we want to empower the community to translate and internationalize Carpentry's lessons and that needs to be done through better recognition of the role translators play within the community, through systems and processes that integrate translations into the way the lessons are written and built and maintained, and through support for the community building and community engagement that is really necessary to expand translations and to make them sustainable. So from my perspective as curriculum team lead, the principal concern that I have is, is how to make sure that we do all of this in a way that's sustainable. How can we ensure that translation project projects are not over reliant on one or two community members and that non English lessons hold the same status as the English counterparts. How can we incorporate um, translation and, and internationalization um, into our existing systems and processes as well for, for lesson maintenance and for lesson publication and um, uh, curriculum advisory committees and all of all of those things that support our lessons currently and these are really difficult questions honestly and, and answering them require will require a, a pretty big investment of time and energy we need to engage with and build on the existing translation community and we need to get to grips with what the um, bottlenecks and challenges and opportunities are there uh, we want to explore different options for how we can incorporate translation um, into into the lesson ecosystem. And I mean, the, the solution that Joel just presented is, is a big step towards that. But I think at least on the kind of human infrastructure side, thinking about the maintainer community and the curriculum advisor community and so on, there's a lot of unanswered questions um, still there. And we need to think strategically about all of this as well to make sure that we're intentional in the steps that we're taking and that we're building something that can really be sustained in the future. The curriculum team right now is pretty small. We've got, I think, approximately two full-time equivalents. Um, and within that curriculum team, honestly, we, we kind of lack the ex the experience and the perspective that would be required to do that work to support translation well. Um, however, having said that, I also understand in, in a session like this and the, 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 um, the presentations that Joel and David just gave are a, are a real demonstration that there's a desire and an energy out there behind translating lessons right now. And um, we need to be engaged with that and we need to try to foster that or we might find that these amazing people like Joel and David and the other people that are working on translations have decided to take their time and their expertise elsewhere and contribute to a different project. And I think that would be a, a terrible loss really for the carpentry. 
Um, and furthermore, I guess with the with the workbench that Joel mentioned, uh, that new lesson infrastructure currently under under development, this is really an opportunity. And even I would say there's a need there to to incorporate lesson translations before that workbench infrastructure grows to a size and a complexity and a maturity where it's more difficult to to integrate translations fully. So right now we're looking for funding that would allow us to bring someone into the curriculum team to coordinate activity around uh, translations and internationalization. Um, and I'm pretty confident that we'll find that funding soon, but we haven't found it yet. And so in the meantime, I guess, before we have additional sort of person power within the, the curriculum team to, to dedicate to that activity, I'm keen to find ways that we can support the, the current translation efforts and make that easier um, and engage with it in general without requiring a really large investment of time from the core team because that's a resource that simply isn't really available right now. And also I want to ensure that we're introducing support uh, in a way that doesn't kind of undermine the sustainability of the project in the long term. That was quite a lot of talking and now I regret not preparing slides, but I hope you followed. Um, and I can pop notes into the, that if you want to review what I said afterwards as well. Thanks so much, Toby. And I try to capture notes um, in the etherpad that you can clean up a little bit, hopefully. Um, but I try to capture some of the major points that you were making. So thank you so much. Um, uh, Camila, we'll uh, turn it over to you to talk a little bit about um, what the Turing Way has been doing for um, translations. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, great. Yes, okay. we can. Uh huh. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, so I have some slides and I have some issues of loading them into the into the shared drive. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put a link to where my slides are uh, in Google Drive. Uh, okay, so so yes, yeah, so I'm Camila. I work at the Alan Turing Institute as a research data scientist. Uh, the Alan Turing Institute is kind of where the Turing Way was born. And just for a bit of context, um, I'm, I'm from Venezuela in Latin America. My first language is Spanish. And although I have been doing most of my professional life in Europe and speaking English, uh, I have always tried to uh, contribute to like, especially educational uh, activities in Latin America and in Venezuela. So this is kind of how uh, I have been motivated by, by translating the Turing way, because I remember when I was like doing my undergrad in Venezuela, you were just expected to learn English and to know English. And uh, what, what happens in Latin America, at least, is that in school, you don't really learn any good enough English to do anything. And so what happens is that just people, middle class people, people who have the extra money to go to the private English classes will be able to do that. And that will just create a disadvantage for people who just didn't have those resources. So I, I, I deeply believe that uh, that education and material should be in the language for, for that people speak so everyone can access it and everyone gets a better playing field uh, into their future. So, so yeah, so now I'm going to talk about the Turing Way. And so, so the Turing Way is an open source guide uh, on data science. And we involve and support a diverse community. Uh, uh, to uh, oh, there's some lines, okay. Uh, that to make uh, data science uh, reproducible, ethical, collaborative, and inclusive for everyone. So the Turing Way was born at the Alan Turing Institute, uh, which is where I work, which is the National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. But it, it was just born there, but it's not just something that belongs to the to the to Turing. It's, it is now a, a hopefully a global community. So. We have different type of guides that try to like give best practices uh, for um, for um, reproducibility, project design, communication, collaboration, ethical research, and a community handbook uh, that kind of tries to document uh, how to contribute and how to do a lot of the things in, in, in the different guides that we provide. So this is a, a, a Kind of a new project. Uh, it has been going on for two and a half years, but it has already more than 170 pages, and uh, it has kind of different type of uh, 
uh, resources, we have events, uh, uh, and uh, we have like 275 direct guide GitHub uh, contributors and thousands of users. And so in this, in the right, you can see kind of how the growth of the, of the Huttering Way has gone on in, in, in the last two and a half years. So there are different ways to contribute into the, to the Turing Way from like mentoring contributions, uh, try to maintain the, the, the book, uh, share resources, uh, do reviews and, or, or contribute with content. But something we've been focusing in, in, the, in, in, in more recently is in how to make it global. And that's where the translation comes as a very important point. And uh, so the translation of the Turing Way has kind of a, Two part story. So first started uh, 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 with the idea of like translating into Spanish and Japanese, which were the two communities who were interested in translating using uh, the carpentries as documentation to, 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 to begin this process and using trans effects. And uh, what happened was like, well, we, we started with kind of a static version of the repository. Uh, this was just before the pandemic. So when the pandemic happened, uh, at least in the Spanish communities, the one I was trying to maintain, uh, there was a lot of people interested in translating and we went into the trans effects page and we started working on it. Uh, but I, I really wish I would have come to this panel like two years ago and like uh, understand like the different parts of the of, of, of how the translation will happen from the maintaining side to the localization side. So we kind of focused too much on the localization and didn't think about the maintaining side too much. And what ended up happening it was because as well because of the pandemic there was a lot of new content in the Turing way and our branches were completely outdated. So. Once we had kind of enough material, we said, okay, we can deploy this. We realized that was not really a real version of the Turing way <laughs> right now. And so, and, and also there were these other languages, uh, like for example, Arabic, uh, and, uh, and we were kind of doing machine translation ourselves. Basically we're using DeepL to translate and to copy back into trans effects and, and then kind of doing localization. So it would make sense because always machine translation is not good enough. Uh, and so, 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 so we kind of said like, okay, let's stop and let's try to think this again and think it now, knowing a little bit more about all the steps that we'll need for a, for a good successful uh, translation and, and sustainable uh, effort. So, so, so this makes us move to crowding, which is the platform we're using now. Oh, sorry, I didn't click on the right one. Uh, and this happened in a book dash, which is kind of a, 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 an event that the Turing Way uh, promotes a couple of times a year, where like for a week, we it's kind of like a hackathon of like creating content or maintaining the book. And so this in the book dash in, in, in 2021 in November, uh, we decided to reorganize the workflows and, uh, and, uh, and the communication between the original repository and the translation platform and, and, the, and, the, and the deployment of the book, which is uh, used with Netlify. And we kind of like re, re, re thought about how to, how to, how to, um, uh, the, 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 the well, like, like the rules of how to translate, and 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 very luckily, and I'm so happy about this. And we have uh, some new people coming into into contribute. So so, so now we have we are four colleagues. Uh, there is Batul, Alejandro, Andrea, and me. And uh, I will say uh, Batul came, and she she's the one who's been like leading the the, the crowding and the and the in the infrastructure side, and she's been amazing. And I think we would be completely lost without her. So I just want to shout out <laughs> for her. And so 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 yeah. So we wanted to like uh, yeah have a little bit of more thought on like governance and like like it felt like our first effort was like very rudimentary, and now we had to do it right. So that's what we're trying to do uh, now. So oh, every time I click on my yeah. Sorry. Uh, so yes. So so some challenges from the future, and I I already have seen some ideas from the talk from David and uh, how to acknowledge people where they have been contributed because you can have people just translating one paragraph and, and, and in one chapter. But how do you acknowledge right in the right place? So so that's something we've been discussing and also like thinking about governance and uh, and. Um, and also how to deploy like multiple languages uh, in the same in the same Netlify environment. It's been things we're currently thinking right now. 
And uh, yeah, just I want to finish just uh, thanking all of the contributors uh, and users of the Turing Way community. And uh, that will be all from me. Great, thanks so much, um, Camila, really appreciate it. Um, a round of applause <laughs> to all of our um, panelists for their presentations. Um, I have been adding it into the etherpad, um, but feel free to add any questions that you have um, for the panelists into the Zoom chat. Um, we did have one come in that was added to the etherpad, and I'm going to um, add it into the chat so that the panelists um, can see it. But um, if anyone would like to respond to any of the questions that come in, if you just raise your hand, I can call on you and we can go around um, uh, so folks can respond. Um, but the, the question um, was, how can curriculum advisory committee members and other Carpentries advocates best support translation efforts? Um, Toby. I don't think I have a good answer for this question, um, but I guess it might help others on the call for me to summarize briefly what the curriculum advisory committees do, I suppose, um, uh, to try to give some context to this. So we have curriculum advisors for um, our official lessons, I guess, so software data and library carpentry lessons, and those curriculum advisors um, take a relatively high level view of the, the content of those lessons and how those lessons fit together with other lessons in the curriculum. So for example, in software carpentry, the, um, the curriculum advisors would, would look at the content in the shell lesson, the Git lesson, and the programming lessons, and, and consider how that all fits together, and whether changes in one place might mean that there need to be changes elsewhere, and so on. And that's in contrast to the lesson maintainers, who who handle the more sort of day to day upkeep of lessons and ensure that our lessons stay working and and usable and teachable on a on a day to day basis, but are not responsible for considering the sort of larger scale changes and updates that might need to happen to to those lessons. Um, and I think that in the context of, of translations, the, the second part of the question was kind of what curriculum advisors and other advocates for the, for the carpentries could do to support translation. And I would guess that the answer to this is encourage more people to get involved with, with translating, first and foremost. From a curriculum advisory standpoint, that's really one of the, the parts of that whole curriculum ecosystem that I mentioned that we'll really need to think about how that works in the context of lessons in multiple languages, right? Because what I want to see is, is a future where um, people can contribute improvements and updates to our lessons in any language as well, and not only have kind of this central version being English and that being considered like the source of truth, if you like, and then all of the translation effort being from English to other languages. What I'd really like is a future where this global community that we're trying to build can contribute to make our lessons better without needing to know English in the, in the first place. But our whole ecosystem of, of curriculum advisors and maintainers and, and documentation and so on is all based around the assumption that this stuff is done in English. And so I guess in the short term, my answer is you could probably, you should try to find people who want to do translations and encourage them to do them to our lessons and to get involved with what Joel and David have already described. Um, and in the medium to long term, be open and involved in the conversation that we'll need to have about how we incorporate um, the global community into this kind of curriculum advisory structure. Thanks, Toby. Um, did any of the other panelists want to respond to that question or to Toby's comments? 
Um, oh, go ahead, Dean. <laughs> okay, well, sorry. I I actually wanted to, I had a couple ideas related to the sort of end of Toby's answer there. Uh, so for one thing, with the just as a technical point, is with the PO files, you don't have to have any particular language as the input language. It could be something other than English. It could be anything. Um, so that's just, th there's been confusion about that in the past. So that's just one thing to clarify. And um, as far as, and, and another, I think, really important point is that I think we need to think about translating other documentation besides just the lessons, um, especially things like code of conduct, uh, and other really important, and that would be a higher priority one, but there's lots of other documentation that the software that Carpentries uses that would be useful to have in local communities. Uh, and, and then the other thing is, um, as far as, yeah, incorporating changes into a non-English, um, uh, uh, into a non-English version of content, um, I'm not sure, I don't either have a good idea for how, how to propagate it throughout, but um, if there is existing translation in a particular repo, um, someone could come in and, and comment on that in their language and, you know, and um, point to things, uh, lines of code, um, as is often done when, when someone has something, uh, a recommendation to make to a lesson is often done via an issue or a pull request, right? So. Uh, they could do that in that language, um, and then, but taking it from there and and propagating it throughout is is a different matter. So those are just some thoughts on on, on those topics. Thanks so much, Joel. Um, David. Uh, just returning what Toby said. If you want to be more involved, uh, come and talk or ask for being translate like translation. One thing to be. A warning, though, is that translation is not that simple. Translation, uh, if you want to do it well uh, by translating one sentence, it's helpful because it will help the people uh, that that are uh, doing the editorial work. But sometimes there's some communities where they don't allow that. In the cabinets, we're not putting any restriction on that, but they don't allow that because it's harder to keep consistency. So how we evolve forward in the future is something to see. And if you really want to help, uh, even if we only to translate one word or translate to praise like the glossario as well in the carpentries, that's a uh, super welcome. Uh, if you want to be involved in the community, it will take a, a bit of commitment and, and, and it will, yeah, it's hard. Uh, the other thing is that I was. I have the question here asked for Toby, but he just answered it in a way that it's how we can work with lessons that are only in a different language, and how the committee, the advisory, the committee could learn of those things and say, oh, we want actually that lesson also in English or in other languages, and and what uh, also what Joel was saying that the translation between the flow from one way to another, it's it's not that straightforward, and it can follow into a kind of a what I call like a Wikipedia uh, model where it's not, you have something and everything is translated in the same way, but it, it's translated or it's something, but they have different lives, which it, there's a beauty on that as well. So I, what is the best model? I don't know how to make this thing work better. I don't know. I decided back then when I started in 2014 that we we're gonna use something as a source, like a true source and then evolve from that. But there, None of the things that I decide back then, it has to be as a truth or as a, as a, as a fact that we're going to follow for all, forever. We have to revise all the things. We have to make, have the mechanism to revise the things once and again and see, are we doing that right? Do we want to change that? How can we do it better? So yeah, so many things. <laughs> Great, thanks so much. Um, uh, Feel free, as I said, to continue to add any questions that you have for the panelists into the Zoom chat. Um, there is um, a question that uh, um, I wanted to ask about, um, you know, it, it sounds like from what the Turing Way is doing, um, there's efforts within the Carpentries community. There are a lot of other adjacent open science communities that are doing this work. And so how can we kind of come together and support each other 
um, in this work that we're doing um, to move all of this forward in a way that is um, uh, building off of what we've already done, what we've learned from, from what we've already done, but also addressing the challenges that we've all um, brought up during the panel today. So just wanted to hear um, what uh, folks think about that in terms of how can we continue to have these conversations and work together um, to keep momentum and moving these things forward collaboratively. Maybe I'll start with from from the Dreamwave uh, side. So um, I think well the, the the initial efforts of translated we already were using uh, the carpentry's uh, knowledge. So so uh, I think uh, a documentation of, of of work or processes and workflows are are very very useful and that's something we're trying to do in the Dreamwave. We try and we have this community handbook that should like document very well how to do translations and not only for the Turing way but for like other efforts. Uh, but I think that's hard uh, because it's, uh, as, as we can see in this panel, like there is very little uh, things that work for one then one project need and the other doesn't and, and, and so and, and it's difficult that it won't become one maintainer will, will be the one keeping the whole process alive and the whole effort alive and or, or as David said like a bottleneck but it's not it's, it's just like there is someone who is very important to, to keep the thing going and I feel that that's also dangerous because it puts a lot of pressure on voluntary work of one person but at the same time um, doesn't allow the others uh, uh, to, 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 to contribute uh, like, like, yeah, the, the learning curve is, is, is kind of steep, I feel, uh, still at the moment. And so we, we need to see how we can do the learning curve less steep. That, that would be my... Yeah. Thanks so much, Camila. Um, Toby. Sorry, I lost my um, screen for a moment. There we are. Uh, so... I, I, I watched. Um, well, I watched the translation of um, Shanina's keynote yesterday, and I don't know how many folks here were were present at that at that keynote talk. But um, one of the things that Shani um, kind of quoted was this um, this idea of nothing for us without us, right? And um, I think the what I was really trying to get out get at in, in the kind of opening um, talk that I gave was um, that this is all about trying to engage with the community that does the translations and support the work that that they want to do, and the, that's why we want to find somebody who can do that from within from within the core team. Um, on the workbench side and the lesson infrastructure side, that carpentry's workbench is, first of all, it's, it's an incredible piece of work, I think. Um, Xi'an has been driving that almost exclusively on his own up until now. It's, it's the product, kind of the culmination currently of, of two plus years of work on his part. And um, what he has achieved already is amazing. But he recognizes and I think we all recognize that he's not he can't and shouldn't try to create an internationalization framework for the workbench on his own because he's not someone that's doing translations and so he doesn't know what's important and that's why it's so cool that um that Joel has has done what he's done with the uh, dovetail package and and looked already at how this could be incorporated into into the workbench and so I think that the next step on that infrastructure side is to make sure that we we keep this conversation going which sounds like a bit of a cliche but I think it's really important to to make sure that at least in the in the immediate next stages of the workbench development which is the the kind of beta phase that's going to begin after this conference ends um to make sure that any develop any further development on the workbench side is not likely to make it 
harder for um, translations and internationalization to be incorporated into that and integrated into that um, infrastructure in general. And then on the sort of community engagement side, I think having that conversation and trying to make sure that we continue to engage with the people who are actually doing the work of translation is essential to make sure that it gets supported properly from, from within the core team. And yeah, I think the other thing that I already sort of hinted at, well, uh, addressed in the in the opening talk was that we're really actively trying to recruit somebody or well we're trying to get the funding so that we are then able to recruit somebody to um, dedicate their time from the core team to really um, integrating translation fully. Thanks so much Toby. Um, Joe had asked about a link to a translation resource from the Turing Way, but I think Camila, you had already given that to us, right? And I added that into the, okay. So I'll get that added um, into um, the uh, notes document as well. And Benson had the question about machine translation and if that would be helpful. So I didn't know if any of you wanted to comment on, um, uh, on machine translation at all in your experience with that. Um, David. Yes, they're helpful, and each time I can I've seen how they've been more helpful or more or better translations itself. Still, so uh, one of the lessons we translate back in 2019 or something, we used literally like the Google Translate. There was this kind of a, um, add-on that we could put in the page, and it was given already that page translated. It's still not perfect right so still needs some hands there so there's a lot of um so many of the platform like transfix or crowding and and which one whatever all those um things offer the way that you get a, the translate the translate the automatic translation directly already as a translation and then you review them or you modify them and that's a good way to because sometimes you get stuck like how do I translate that into Spanish? My own language, I don't even know how to say that sentence. And I get like frustrated. And sometimes uh, you go to the a, a translation a page and they're like, oh, right, that's how it that's how it says in Spanish. Yes, now that makes sense. Uh, but still the whole lesson translated like that, it wouldn't, it would be readable for a person, a, but still it will miss a flow that I, haven't seen the, the automated translations to to get yet. Probably in the future it will be probably it will be better um, as the time comes. But uh, at the moment, it's still it's as, a, as an aid tool to help you to translate, and it's still yes, very useful. Yeah, if I may, I would just step in and, and say that I think at least for now we would always want to have a human in the loop um, checking. I mean, we do that for our human generated translations, right? So I, I, I don't think we can, uh, hundred percent trust a machine to get it perfect. Um, and that's also something that I just learned about translating in, in general, actually, is you always want to have, and I don't want to make an artificial distinctions here, but, um, it, it's good to have someone with a lot of experience and contextual knowledge um, doing the the final check um, because they can catch things that otherwise might not you know go unnoticed. Um, but I, I think Camila, did you mention that you that transit or that uh, Turing way is using um, some uh, machine generated translations? So yeah, I mean we in crowding like the, we get offer of different type of. Uh, machine translations, but we just use it as a base and then we recontextualize because it's never good enough. So we will almost never use exactly what they are proposing, but it does help a little bit into like, you have to type less and then you can just correct here and there, yeah. And actually I would make a quick comment too, is that I think when we're doing the localization part, you know, making the translated text, it's really useful to have these two roles of translator and reviewer because I'm uh, not a native Japanese speaker, um, I can, I, but I'm quite comfortable reading it and checking the meaning. 
And so it's helped, and I can catch some things that perhaps non-native English speakers, Japanese, who, who have translated into Japanese may be missed in the original meaning. So it's, it's really useful to have different members of the community with different abilities who can contribute to those different roles. Um, and yeah, machine translation might be part of that, but I think humans, you know, always keeping humans in the loop is important too. Um, thanks so much, Joel. Um, there is another question um, for you, Camilla, in the um, etherpad, um, wanting to uh, have you explain a bit more about why you moved um, to Crowdin from TransFX. I guess, yeah, that's for me. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so when crowding was like the first uh, workflow crowding was deployed, I think that was 2019. And it felt like we, it wasn't clear to us how to update the, 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 the report. Didn't have options for machine translation. And like right away, we had to still go to a page outside. And I'm pretty sure that's not the case anymore, or, or it's a lot more configurable, but we didn't have the knowledge of someone who understood the platform well enough. That, I think that that's the main point. So when, when we moved to crowding, we have a, a, a person who had used crowding before and knew how to configure it in different ways and worked with different languages that we can learn glossaries from each other and things like that. So we just had someone who felt very comfortable and was in contact in fact, with the developers of crowding and asked them for like a, a, for, 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 for features and things. So I think that was the main reason for us moving was, was convenience and, and, and feeling more comfortable using crowding than, than, than transfers. Thank you for answering that. That was my question. And the reason I brought it up is because there's many platforms in addition to those two uh, for doing translation. And I'm not familiar with most of them. <laughs> and so when we're talking about coming up with the, and, and one problem that, that we've dealt with in the community, in the carpentries with translating things is that sort of each language community has come up with their own solution. And it would be great if instead of reinventing this each time and, and going through the same struggle, if we can come up with a more standardized way, and that would include the, the, the platform. So although as David, David showed, there's we've got several languages on TransFX, uh, we don't necessarily think that that is the best and the only way to do it. So uh, one thing that we need to do as a community is to look at different platforms and, and make a decision about which seems is gonna, like it will be the best for our, our needs. Um, David. Yeah. I'm gonna add on that because I was who choose TransFX back then. And a, so I, I looked many, I looked Crowding, Weblay, TransFX, PO, Edit, and the website of that and someone else, some, someone more. A, I think that Crowding and TransFX were my two top ones because they were the ones that were provided as, as a service and it was for free. The other ones, Weblade, for example, is an open source project, which I would love to have it, but uh, we needed a server to run it. So I, back then between crowding and TransFX, I think I, I think to remember, I may I have to check my notes back again, but TransFX had the option, the command line interface with the particular thing I needed to pull and push only the things that I wanted. With encroding, uh, they were something different. And those things have changed a lot. Now, one of the things that all WebLate and, trans and Crowding has, which doesn't have TransFX yet as a whole uh, organization, or not only organization, but a whole set of repositories is the translation memory. So the translation memory is when you find a sentence that it's the same sentence that in another project, either from your organization or from any other different project has already appeared. And it tells you, say, oh, look, this KDE community or this uh, Mozilla community or this Jupyter community is using, is translating that in this way from English to Spanish. And you're like, all right, that's that's the word I want to use. That's the And, and that is very useful. And TransFX, right now, I think it only have it between a single project, not even in the same organization. So it's very, very painful to get that uh, translation memory from all the things because you want to have all the lessons to refer to the same thing. For example, I don't know, the terminal. Uh, you don't want to call it terminal in one place, console in another, and I don't know, black screen in another. So to have all them consistency, uh, con consistent to have a better, I don't know, 
Like it looks from this, you're, it looks like you're in the same place all the time, not like you're learning something else each time differently. Um, Camila. Yeah, I just wanted to add that this translation memory kind of like make us feel better because we did a lot of translating in trans effects that then wasn't really usable because it wasn't the book. We didn't know how to match it into the new or how to add it into crowding. And we end up exported it as a translation memory and imported it in crowding as translation memory. So, so every time something that was translated at that time gets added as a suggestion as a and so, and we can trust that we already put a lot of effort. So that work wasn't lost because we were feeling kind of sad that we spent a year on, in work that maybe was never going to be used. And, 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 and that was great. Yeah. Well, I, um, I want to uh, draw attention to the time. Um, we have about nine minutes um, left in the panel. I, I did want to let you all know I've been trying to take notes, but I'm sure um, I've made some errors. Um, so would encourage the panelists to um, go to the etherpad and please add in, uh, any clarifications that you feel should be added there. And I'm sure I've missed some things. So I um, would like to apologize for that. Um, but uh, in my role um, as the lead um, for the community, the community development team um, for the Carpentries, I do not have the knowledge of the infrastructure side um, that Toby and his um, team do. Um, however, um, I uh, uh, think that translations has continued to emerge as a priority among our community. And I'd like to spend the last little bit of time to find out from all of you how um, the community development team specifically could just support having a space for all of you to connect, um, chat about where things are, um, identifying maybe where we could put the resources that all of you have developed so other people can easily find them, for example. Um, I just would like to hear a little bit more um, because I, I We've had some really great discussions about translations, but I would really like to have some actionable next steps to kind of move what we've been talking about forward in some way, even if it's just a small step. Um, but what what does that look like and how um, how can we best support you? Um, especially thinking about, you know, waiting as, as Toby had mentioned about getting some funding to really put a lot of effort and energy behind the infrastructure side. What can we do right now to just keep these things moving forward and support you all in this work? Um, Joel. So um, one thing that occurred to me after hearing um, uh, what's going on at the Turing Way, which I found really interesting and, and useful, and of course, Turing Way translation efforts started with information that they gained from the Carpentries, right? So I think um, maybe if we could try to, it might be possible to come up with some more formal way of exchanging information and, and sharing sort of tips and tricks or whatever you know useful things uh, that our communities can draw upon because I think we're really similar in, in terms of sort of our philosophies and, and goals and, and even the content, you know. Um, and so I don't know, maybe that could be like a web page or a, just a GitHub repo or something a little bit more permanent than occasional uh, chats um, that we could use to to share information. And and like, you know, if you have like if we have thoughts about a particular trans translation platform and and its you know advantages and disadvantages like that could be really useful information for everybody um so yeah that's one thought great thanks so much joel and camila i know the the turing way translation team has regular meetings as well um i'm in that slack workspace and i don't know if you want um to comment on how often you all are meeting um, to, to talk about some of the work that you're doing together. 
Yeah, we, we try to meet once a week. Uh, I think it's more like a space of uh, some people might not feel motivated to do stuff by themselves because they never would like prioritize it. I say, you know, if there is other people, you can say hello and uh, know a little bit the community. We, 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 we put that space there. So, so usually what we do is just we come and then there is kind of a Pomodoro timer and we just go into some translation and, and, and then at, at the end of the hour, well, we all share what we did. And uh, it is kind of like, I think, <clears throat> Not obviously, like we we, it, we we need to be able to promote a synchronously translation as well. We want to do that's why we try to document as much as possible. But also for some people, they just need someone in the other side of the screen to like feel motivated to, to do a little bit of work. So because again, this is all voluntary. No one, no, no, for no one is their main job, right? So 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 anything we can make like human interaction to make uh, people feel a bit more motivated to do it uh, helps. Uh, Great, thank you so much for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, even even this topic um, uh, emerged. I, I, in my first few months, I guess, in my role with the Carpentries, um, I had a conversation with David where he he talked a lot about the work um, that he's been doing on some of these efforts, and then having additional conversations. This is definitely something again that's high priority. I feel within the community, and so. I just wanted to let um, anyone on the call, um, I know we had our panelists today, but if there's anyone who would really like to dive a little bit further into these conversations and be involved and in even um, just providing some recommendations um, that we can um, let the curriculum team know when they are thinking about infrastructure changes and developments, what that might look like and things that should be considered. Um, I, I would love to, to figure out a way to create space for us to um, pull that information together. Um, I think a GitHub repository would be a really great start. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we're all really busy and that may be all that we need right now. But um, if folks would like to start getting together, even if just quarterly, slow, like every few months, um, come together um, to have some conversations, I could set up a couple of meetings in different time zones. Um, again, just to, just to um, have a time to connect, get a little updates from everyone, document that. Um, and again, if there are any recommendations, we can at least keep the conversation going and, and um, make sure that everyone's um, knowledgeable and aware of, of what's happening. Um, so just would like to, um, uh, you know, encourage all of you, um, I am going to add my email address into the chat here. Um, so if you are interested in being in, engaged in that way, and again, I know everyone's very busy and many are overcommitted, um, but if you are interested, um, please uh, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you and we can um, see what might work from it for everyone. Again, even if it's just coming together every few months and then having a repository where we capture everything um, between that time. So I um, uh, just wanted to thank again, all of the um, panelists. Um, this I think was a wonderful conversation. Um, there is going to be another panel on this same topic. Um, we're going to have um, different panelists. Um, Joel is going to be the consistent <laughs> um, panelist that's going to be um, uh, on, on both panels, but the information about the second panel is um, at the top of the etherpad. Um, so if you do have colleagues that you know would be interested in being engaged and learning more about what's happening, um, please encourage them to attend that session. Um, this one, again, is being recorded and we'll be making it available um, to the broader community as well um, to share, share this as a resource. Um, again, I think even raising awareness of what you all have done um, is really a, a big step forward. So um, just wanted to thank you all again. Um, very much appreciate your time and thank you all um, for attending today's um, conversation as well. So. Well, thanks again to Alicia and to uh, all the panelists, uh, the panelists for <laughs> for joining today. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a beautiful day or night. <laughs> <laughs>
Thanks, everyone. That was really brilliant.